Do you know what Islam says? It says that life's the greatest. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode. We left off last time discussing the miracles of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We first discussed the miracles that occurred around him as evidence of his divine appointment to prophethood. We then discussed the miracles that occurred through him by the will of Allah. And we left off discussing the fact that he received revelation that at times proved prophetic. One very interesting point about this, he never received a prophecy in revelation, but that it came true. One thing that we know about those who prophesy is that some things may come true, but there is a great deal that does not. What should we say about somebody who presents himself as a prophet, as a messenger to mankind, and every single thing that is ever revealed to him as revelation comes true. This is a very strong evidence to the sincerity, the honesty of the man, and the divine nature of his appointment, prophethood. One example of one of these prophetic revelations was when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was visited by some messengers from Persia. He informed them upon their arrival that the emperor of Persia, their emperor, had died during their absence. In fact, he had been murdered. They returned to Yemen where they were met with a letter informing them of the fact that indeed the emperor of Persia had been murdered. The governor of Yemen and his followers accepted Islam on this evidence alone, for there was no possible way that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in Mecca, in the Arabian desert, could possibly have known that the emperor of Persia had been murdered, except through the path of revelation. Similarly, a false prophet, al-Aswad al-Ansi, was killed in Yemen one day before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. Nonetheless, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was visited by al-Aswad's delegates at that time, and he informed them of al-Aswad's demise, the fact that al-Aswad had been killed in Yemen. And again, there was no possible way this information could have reached him. Remember that at this time, information was transmitted by trading caravans. It took weeks or months to travel from one place to another. And yet, Al-Aswad was killed one day before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. He informed Al-Aswad's delegates and when they returned, they found out that the information was true. The most impressive to many people was the miracle of the splitting of the moon. When the Quraysh asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a sign of his prophethood, he pointed to the moon, they looked up, and the moon split in two. Well, it's a powerful story. Of course, it's a relatively undeniable sign. As the Red Sea, as Allah could divide the Red Sea for Moses, the tradition is that he divided the moon for Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are a few of the many, many miracles which occurred around the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or were conducted by him by the will of Allah. Now let's move on to another category by which we can provide evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is an analysis of his character. If we close our eyes and think about Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, what do you see? Probably not very much. We do not have much in biblical scripture to inform us about these prophets and yet we know them for what they were, but we do not know a great deal about them. 
When we hear stories about certain of the prophets, many of these stories do not jibe with our expectations. The story of Noah getting drunk and stripping himself naked and falling down unconscious naked from his drunkenness. The story of Lot committing incest with his daughters, albeit drunk at the time. The story of Jesus cursing the fig tree, degrading the Gentiles, and rebuking his mother. The story of Judah committing fornication. The story of David committing murder out of his lust for Bathsheba, arranging for her husband to be sent to his death. These stories do not jibe with our expectations of what a prophet would be like. So when we ask ourselves questions like, well, what was Abraham like? It is a little disconcerting that we cannot form a strong opinion because we do not have enough information to know what they looked like, how they acted, what they did, what they even taught in many cases. And yet, we find in the example of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, traditions and historical descriptors that make him clear in all of these aspects. In particular, his piety is well described by both his followers and his enemies. Let me read a description from the New International Encyclopedia. Quote, the essential sincerity of his, referring to Muhammad, of his nature cannot be questioned. And a historical criticism that blinks no fact, yields nothing to credulity, weighs every testimony, has no partisan interest, and seeks only the truth, must acknowledge his claim to belong to that order of prophets who, whatever the nature of their physical experience may have been, in diverse times and in diverse manners, have admonished, taught, uttered austere and sublime thoughts, laid down principles of conduct nobler than those they found, and devoted themselves fearlessly to their higher calling, being irresistibly impelled to their ministry by a power within. We find that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was devoted to the message he claimed as revelation. He was a simple man. He lived in single room, mud brick apartments, slept on a rough leather mat stuffed with palm fiber, he ate whatever was available through times of hardship and partook of unrefined foods only in moderation during times of plenty. There were many occasions when he had nothing to eat but dates and water, sometimes for months. He prayed two-thirds of the night, fasted in all seasons, and gave away any gifts or profits to the poor or in the name of the religion. Generosity was legendary, his manners exemplary, his comportment inspiring. He died as he lived, a pauper. He was known to have milked his own goat, he mended his own clothes, cobbled his own shoes, served his family in their home, attended to the poor and ailing. When manual labor was called for, he carried two stones where everybody else carried one. When the Masjid Kuba was constructed, he was the first to lay stones. At the Battle of the Trench, when the companions were unable to prevail over a boulder in digging the trench, he took up the digging tools and by invoking the name of Allah, demolished the boulder. At the Battle of Uhud, he was challenged to soul battle. His companions offered to fight in his stead. He refused, faced the challenger alone and was victorious. And you know what? These stories go on and they go on and they go on far longer than we have time for, unfortunately. Once again, I would like to quote from a book from which you would not expect to find such a positive quote, the New Catholic Encyclopedia. For once again, 
if we find the truth among those who would be most likely to oppose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we must respect it. Quote, his adversaries, among whom were many Jews and Christians, watched eagerly for indications of fraud. And Muhammad was able successfully to assume a remarkable self-assured attitude toward any accusations of that sort. Read between the lines. What is the New Catholic Encyclopedia telling us? that the Jews and the Christians watched eagerly for indications of fraud and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam quote, was able successfully to assume a remarkable self-assured attitude toward any accusations of that sort. In other words, they looked for fraud. They never found it. We're going to take a break. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Eyes is the place we need. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown. Continuing this episode, we are discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm going to continue by moving on to the evidence of his persistence and steadfastness. In particular, it is well documented that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was persistent against all levels of adversity. His believers were ostracized, they were assaulted, they were tortured, and at times they were murdered. In the case of Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, he was threatened, humiliated, beaten, stoned, driven out of his home and his city. His beloved wife, Khadija, died while they were in forced exile. And yet, despite all of this, and despite the frequent attempts upon his life, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood in prayer at night until his body rebelled. On one occasion, in the Holy Quran, Surah 58, Ayat 2, Allah revealed that he forgave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for his sins, past, present, and future. And yet, what did he do? What would anybody do? What would anybody who has been told by Allah, by our Creator, of the promise of Jannah, the promise of Paradise, who has been informed that their sins have been forgiven, past, present, and future. What would that person do? Well, I think we all know the vast majority of mankind would throw a party of, dare I say, biblical proportions. But the point is that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do this. He did not lower his level of worship. In fact, he continued his level of worship as it was, to the point where one of his wives asked him, hasn't God forgiven you that which is before you and that which is behind you? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, should I not be a thankful servant? Should these not be the words of a prophet? In fact, are these not the words of nothing but a prophet? Who else bearing the forgiveness of their sins, past, present, and future, would continue their worship unaltered, simply out of love of their Creator, simply out of love of their Creator and thankfulness for the blessings He has bestowed upon them. The example of a man? No. Men hearing this message would, even if they did not want to, they would not be able to help it. They would lower their level of worship. They would relax because they would have a feeling that they made it. They succeeded. They have the promise of Jannah. They have the promise of paradise. But this is not the example that we find with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. On one occasion, someone called the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O best of mankind. How would a charlatan respond? Somebody who is trying to fool his followers. When told, O best of mankind, oh, yes, <clears throat> well, thank you. No, that's not what he said. He said, that was Ibrahim. 
peace be upon him. He diverted praise from himself to others. On one occasion, a man said, quote, God and you, O Muhammad, have willed this in reference to a certain matter. And Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rebuked him because he saw this man as setting him up as partners with God. In fact, he said, have you made me equal with God? Now, we find other quotations. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stressed the distinction between God and his prophets by teaching, quote, do not overpraise me as the Christians overpraised Jesus, the son of Mary, for I am only his, meaning God's, servant, so say Allah's servant and messenger. We have a very striking story in the story of Muhammad's son, Ibrahim. Ibrahim died as an infant, and on the day of his death, there was a solar eclipse. There was an eclipse of the sun. And the people began to say, oh, the sun has eclipsed for the death of Ibrahim. Now, again, I ask you to put yourself in the situation. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preaching the message of revelation hoping to gather a following. When the people started to say that the sun has eclipsed for the death of Ibrahim, Muhammad's son, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his son, does it not make sense that a charlatan would say, oh yes, well, <coughs> absolutely, yes, that's, that is certainly what makes sense. Uh, I mean, God himself mourns the death of my son, and while we're talking about it, please, would everybody care to donate? That's what a man would do. That's what a charlatan would do. That is not what Muhammad did, peace be upon him. No, Muhammad declared, verily, the sun and the moon are two signs of the signs of Allah. They do not eclipse for the death of anyone, nor for his birth. So if you see that, an eclipse, then supplicate to God, reverence his name, pray, and give charity. Again, he could have used this event to build up his following, to deceive them. He could have used it as a ploy, but he didn't. He recognized it for what it was, demoted his significance in the eyes of the people, in the way that he demoted his significance in the eyes of the people throughout his life, only recognizing himself as Allah's servant and messenger. In fact, even when he lay dying, he instructed his followers not to take his grave as a site of worship. So, another quotation that illustrates his humility, quote, say, I tell you, not with me are the treasures of Allah, nor do I know what is hidden, nor do I tell you I am an angel. I but follow what is revealed to me. That is from the Holy Quran, 650. In 3, 144, we read, quote, Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Would Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have revealed verses that stress his humanity, stress the fact that he is no more than a messenger? Would he have revealed that if he were a charlatan? Remember that this was a time when people worshipped stones. This was a time when people embraced false prophets. This was a time 600 years after the time when the Christians had deified Jesus. Would they have accepted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a god if he had set himself up as a god? Absolutely. But he did not. And he was very careful, as you would expect of a true messenger, of a true prophet of God, he was very careful to save the distinction of divinity for God and for God alone and to clarify the fact that he was nothing more than a man and a messenger. Now, in the case of Mecca, when the Muslims returned to Mecca victorious, taking back Mecca, the city where they had been beaten, the city where they had been persecuted, the city where they had been separated from their wives and their homes, cast out in humiliation, 
the city that had killed their loved ones, the city that had taken from them their very honor, the city that had killed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa favored uncle Hamza, and on the battlefield, the Quraysh, one of them had actually opened his body, cut his body open, and cut his liver and chewed his liver. When they returned after 20 years of persecution to have victory over the city, what did they do? What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa direct them to do? Imagine being in this position where you have been humiliated, beaten, tortured, your followers have been killed. You yourself have suffered every disgrace possible at these people's hands and now you have the upper hand. What would you do? And yet, what did he do? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not take the viewpoint we would expect. It was a time when the conquerors would sever the heads of the men, stack them in the marketplace as a trophy, rape and enslave the women, and enslave the children as well. We saw none of that in his example. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the people what they expected. They asked for mercy, and he gave it. In a bloodless takeover, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgave the population of Mecca, despite all the horrors that they had committed in the past for 20 years. 20 years of suffering, and he forgave it. There were a handful of evil men whose evil was so great that they needed either to be exiled, but only out of these ten, four were executed for their crimes. And in the times in which this occurred, that was such a merciful act, the people almost could not believe it. But they were so impressed that they accepted Islam en masse, even though it was not forced upon them. There is no compulsion in religion, and the people accepted Islam not out of compulsion, but having seen the beauty of this man's mercy in a situation where they understood themselves, as I'm sure you understand, considering how you would act in the same situation, they understood that this was not a level of mercy that could be expected of any man, but a level of mercy that could only have come from a prophet. That concludes this section. We will return next time to discuss this exact point, the evidences of Muhammad's prophethood, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I am Lawrence Brown, bidding you peace. Until next time, peace. I feel the peace.